and welcome to day two of the Congress. Our next speaker, Paul Gardner Steven, is fighting for free, secure, and resilient communications. Um, he's known as the leader of the Servo project, um, building cell phone mesh networks, and also is the creator of the Mega 65 computer that you can see right here. <coughs> and <laughs> so he's going to tell us about his next project right now and also explore some issues that we face about uh, building networks and keeping them secure and resilient. So please welcome Paul Gardner, Stephen, creating resilient and sustainable mobile networks. Thank you. A round of applause. Okay, um, thanks for coming along everyone tonight. It's getting a little bit late in the night. Uh, certainly for me it is, it's past my normal bedtime, so apologies if I yawn, it's not that I'm bored uh, or disengaged, it's just I flew in from Australia yesterday and still haven't really had enough sleep. Um, but we, we should be fine, so cool. So what we can see here, we have the uh, uh, Mega 65 uh, prototype and we have a, a prototype of the Megaphone and I'll talk about those two uh, in a minute. Um, so the entire presentation is actually going to be delivered with the, uh, the technology that we're creating. So a bit of a, a dog food eating session for this kind of thing is a bit of a proof by example uh, that we can actually do useful things with 8-bit systems. Because uh, there's a whole pile of advantages when it comes to the security and digital sovereignty with that. So we can switch the screen to the screen. Ah, super, excellent. Um, so we can have a look and make sure I've got the correct disk in there. Yes, we do. We will drop to C64 mode. And we'll load the, oops, wrong one. Ka. Fortunately, we don't have to wait the, uh, the long time. If I press and hold down the caps lock key, the CPU runs at uh, the full speed instead of normal speed. And so now it'll load up. And it's Commodore 64 software, right? So of course it has to be cracked. Um, even if I had to supply the uh, the originals to the cracking crew uh, because it's 2019. So um, we'll let that go because the uh, the graphics will change a little bit as we go along and let the uh, the greets uh, roll out there. So all of this has been created uh, in FPGA. Uh, so we have complete sovereignty in that sense over the architecture, so that we can really start trying to uh, you know to make systems that we have full control over uh, from that full hardware layer and that are simple enough uh, that it's, we don't need to have a, a huge massive team of people to actually work on these things. A lot of what we're talking about here has been created in maybe three or four person years uh, over the, uh, the last few years. So it's quite possible to, um, uh, to do a lot with these systems without needing to have the huge resources of a multinational company or something which is kind of key. Okay, so we'll do uh, Mega O, 36C3. Okay, and I'll press uh, F5 for presentation mode, uh, which really just hides the cursor. Uh, and then I can use my clicker. Uh, so we have, maybe we'll, uh, we'll switch the, uh, uh, the camera here for a moment. Uh, can we switch the camera? Yep. So it's a uh, you know, genuine homemade Commodore 64 compatible joystick, uh, and it makes the most satisfying click noise when we use it. So if we can switch back to the, uh, the slides, that will be great. Oh, there we are. Super. Cool. So I am indeed going to be talking about creating resilient and sustainable mobile phones, and hopefully that link, when we already have the, uh, the artifact there of the Megaphone prototype, uh, and that will become a little bit clearer uh, as we go through. So actually, the last talk was kind of interesting talking about this whole, uh, from a different angle, this whole thing that communications has actually become really weaponized uh, over the last decade or two in particular. Uh, that you know, we're seeing that you know, where it used to be natural disasters that are the main problem, that now there is this whole problem of man-made disasters, which is a major problem for us. Uh, and so we see internet shutdowns, communication shutdowns, we have surveillance happening in different places where uh, it really oughtn't be happening. 
uh, you know, these state-level actors that are very well resourced, able to find zero-day exploits, and the attack surface, as we know, in modern communications devices, is simply huge. And so this is, you know, this is very asymmetric in the uh, uh, the power equation between, you know, forces that seek to oppress people, and you know, the vulnerable people at the uh, the coalface who are just trying to get on with their lives uh, and live good and decent lives, and need communications to help protect themselves and enable that to happen. Uh, and that we're seeing that the value of communications is so well understood uh, by these, you know, oppressing forces that it really has become quite a, you know, it's quite high up their list of things to do. You know, you don't send the army in first to quieten people down, you cut off their internet uh, as the first thing. So this is part of the backdrop uh, of what we see. And so what I would say is that the digital summer has actually finished. We're now in the digital autumn. We can see, like in the, you know, with, the, uh, with farms and trees and things, that you know, there's still plenty of fruit to see in the early autumn, right? And there's lots on the, f the ground. It feels like this time of plenty will continue. Um, and you know, we can all eat uh, as we need, that there is enough, more or less, to go around. Um, but the risk that we have is from this parable of the, uh, the grasshopper and the ant. Who here knows the parable of the grasshopper and the ant? Hands right up, because it's really hard for me to see up here. OK, we'll swap and say, who doesn't know? Okay, most uh, cool. So I thought actually it was originally a, uh, a German kind of proverb. So this is the story of where the you know the grasshopper is kind of lounging around and enjoying the uh, the summer while the ant's busy carrying all the seeds back into the nest, and you know the ant's telling the grasshopper, "Hey, you need to get some food and stuff and put away for the winter so that you can actually survive the winter." And the grasshopper is basically in denial about the fact that uh, you know the season will change. And then, of course, the season changes, it snows and gets cold, and then the grasshopper kind of goes knocking on the, the door of the ant hole. Not that they kind of really have doors, but that's fine. Um, it's like, oh, I'm starving and cold out here. And the ant is kind of like, well, I you know, told you so kind of thing. And I think actually in the end, then it kind of lets it in because we don't want to scare children too much with these stories. Um, and so this is actually the challenge that we have, that we, it, I love every time I come to these events, all the creativity that we see, you know, we're enjoying the digital summer and all of the things that it's letting us create and you know, the great open source software and tools and everything that's going on is absolutely fantastic. And we want that to be able to continue indefinitely. But we know that, as we said, that, you know, the, you know, the chilling winds are beginning to, uh, to come that tell us that unless we actually uh, do something about it, that this isn't actually going to continue indefinitely. Um, and just a, a statement that I really want to make here is this last dot point that I've got. The freedoms of the second half of the 20th century, post-World War II, are, if you look at history, they are an aberration. To my knowledge, never before, and I fear perhaps never again, will we have that degree of personal liberty, focus on you know, individual freedom and agency and everything that was in this you know, post-world era and is now starting to unwind. And it's starting to unwind back to the normal, totally asymmetric, uh, you know, well, to say sharing of power is the wrong word. It's the greedy collection of power and deprivation uh, of the mass population from having anything resembling a, a fair share of what's going on. And so we have to act if we want for the, you know, the digital summer to continue, or at worst, for the digital winter to be as short and shallow as we can have it. Uh, so that the, um, you know, we can come back to a new digital summer. Um, because once we hit the digital winter, it will actually be too late. Because if we push this analogy, you know, the, the digital winter is the time when there is no food on the tree. It, it isn't any longer possible, or at least practical, to create new technologies to enable us to, you know, to feed our digital needs. And we can't plant any new crops, so to speak, until the digital spring comes again after that. And so the opportunity, like with the grasshopper, is now before the winter comes to say, right, what do we need to have in our store of technologies, our store of protocols, all of these different things, so that when the digital winter comes, we don't starve. And fortunately, you know, we can actually change the length of the digital winter. We can empower people so that you know, the, you know, the bitter cold of the digital winter uh, is moderated uh, and that the spring can come as soon as it can. And a bit of the, the trouble that we have with this, we actually don't know when the digital winter will come exactly. We see these challenges 
uh, around in the way that different governments and uh, you know non-state actors as well are uh, you know working in propaganda and all all of these things that are becoming sadly more uh, intense and acute around us. We don't know when that tipping point will happen, uh, but given the complexity of supply chains and things that are necessary in this, and I think Bunny was talking about that earlier today, um, that this is actually quite easy for it to actually quite quickly flip uh, into the, the digital winter mode. And then, you know, as with the real winter, at the very beginning of winter, there might still be enough to eat, uh, but it gets harder and harder very rapidly. And the, you know, if the winter gets too deep, uh, then it's just not going to be possible uh, to continue with these things. And so we tried to think about what's needed to actually overcome this. What do we need? Focusing on mobile communications is a key piece of that. And there's a reason for that in that it's a way that we can communicate, organize, you know, collectively protect communities against the threats that come in. Uh, if we look at things like the Great Haiti Earthquake just back in 2010, the breakdown of communications and law and order meant that there were quite horrible things going on um, with only about three days, actually, of the earthquake there. Um, so there were um, you know, militias that were basically robbing medical teams, trying to transport people between different hospitals, uh, and there were much nastier things with uh, you know, gangs of people going around from village to village, basically doing whatever they want to whoever they want. Uh, it was really not cool. Uh, and so we want to avoid that kind of problem that comes when people are not able to, um, uh, to collectively work together effectively as a community. And so the GPL4 freedoms that we know from software, um, they're a great starting point. But I think actually we've seen enough things like with TVization and all of these sorts of other challenges that this is not sufficient when it comes to hardware. Um, and there's actually some even more complicated things when you start talking about mobile phone kind of hardware as to how we can do that, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. Um, but these are a starting point of what I've come up with as things that I see as being necessary. There's ample room for improvement and, in fact, with any of what we're trying to do in this space, we need folks to come along and help us. We can't do it alone. Uh, we need to, to work together so that we can uh, help one another when the digital winter comes. So the first freedom is simply the freedom from energy infrastructure. We know critical infrastructure is disturbingly vulnerable, that the security of it is quite bad, but also you have these you know, like large centralized places that produce the energy that we need. Um, and you know, we see power cutoffs in Venezuela and all of these sorts of things, regardless of who's actually doing it, whether it was sabotage or whether it was purposeful from the government, I don't know. It actually doesn't matter. The fact is it happens. Um, but also, of course, in natural disaster, power goes out. Um, fortunately, this is actually one of the easiest things to solve. We just need to include some kind of alternative uh, energy uh, supply into the kind of devices that we're creating. So that could be solar panel on the back, or you could have the, uh, you know, like the Faraday, you know, you shake it like a martini uh, kind of thing to generate power, or both, whatever you feel like. Um, or if you can find a good supply of ex-NASA radioisotope thermal generators, that would also be fantastic and will keep you warm through the, the winter as well. Um, but, you know, if anyone has a supply of those, let me know, I'd love to hear. Um, so then the second freedom is actually quite similar to the first. It's the realization that we need energy to communicate and communications to organize ourselves and be effective. Um, and again, the communications infrastructure is in many ways actually even more fragile than the energy production infrastructure. It's much easier to guard a couple of power stations in a country than it is to guard every phone tower and all of the interconnecting links and all of these sorts of things uh, between them. And as we said, you know, communications deprivation is already being weaponized uh, against the vulnerable around us. Um, again, fortunately, there's been a whole pile of work in this space. So the previous work I've done with the Serval Mesh, and there's, you know, um, uh, Freifunk, and, you know, a whole bunch of groups working on a whole bunch of different things in this kind of space for peer-to-peer, -peer secure, authenticated communication. So, yes, there's work to be done, but this is an area where there's actually already, like the energy one, uh, there's been quite a lot of work done that makes that quite feasible uh, to work on. So then we start getting to some of the, uh, the harder ones. We need to make sure that we are not dependent on uh, you know, the major vendors of our devices uh, when it comes to the security of our devices. So this starts with simple things like the, the GPL provides. So you know, full source code has to be available. Um, but more than that, we actually have to make sure that we can actually exercise those rights in practice. So it needs to be simple enough that we can actually, you know, go right, okay, there's a security vulnerability in such and such. 
uh, like you know, Yiski was talking about earlier today with some of the, the Bluetooth things, and then to actually be able to patch it yourself, um, it's quite obvious that this is not the case for uh, whether it's firmware or whether it's the regular operating system on modern mobile phones. So who here has actually built Android from source themselves? Excellent. I expected to see a few folks here. Who's tried and gave up in disgust? Right. More hands. <laughs> yes, myself as well. Like, you know, I work on the Serval project, and we do a whole pile of things. And basically, just, you know, after spending a number of hours on it, I just went, right, you know, this is actually this is a lot of work for something that ought to be uh, straightforward if we want to be able to make rapid progress. Um, and so we want to have systems that are simple enough that we can patch. But in fact, there's another really key advantage to simplicity that I'll probably come over a few times in this talk, and that is that simplicity reduces the attack surface. If we are in an asymmetric power environment where there are, whether they are state or non-state actors seeking to deprive vulnerable people of communications, um, they're going to have potentially the ability to put whole teams looking for vulnerabilities in software. In contrast, we might be lucky to have someone who's going to try and madly find when things are being uh, exploited and to patch them. So we need to have ways around this kind of thing. Uh, and to my mind, reducing the attack surface is the only way that we can actually have any real hope uh, of you know, uh, being able to keep up in that arms race uh, of security. So freedom number four is related to this previous one. It's actually saying not only do we want to be able to patch it, we actually want to be able to change, enhance, do all of these things. And again, it, it comes back to the same basic need that the software is actually able to be compiled and the hardware designs are simple enough that we can actually, uh, you know, uh, to work on these things so that we, again, not merely in theory have permission to innovate, but that it's in practice feasible to do so. Uh, and again, the simpler the system, the, you know, the, the more probable it is that we can actually succeed in this kind of space. And then, you know, again, these are, a lot of these are quite interrelated. This is part of why I say it would actually be great to get feedback on how we might restructure these to make the boundaries really clear between these freedoms that we need. Um, so we need the freedom to maintain the devices for the long run. So who here has or has had a fair phone, for example? I love the Fairphone, by the way. Yep, a number of us. I've had one as well. Um, and you know, if you talk to the people at Fairphone, I think you know, they have a, a team of a bunch of people just trying to maintain Android on the Fairphone 2, for example, and also now on the, uh, the Fairphone 3 as it comes out. Um, and this is actually really hard work. But again, the, the complexity and the barriers that are there make it really difficult to be able to just keep the thing running with the same hardware, let alone each time you want to target new hardware with new capabilities. This is just going to be, you know, like as a community, we can probably do one or two devices if we kind of all collected our effort in, but to actually do it for, you know, devices that meet individual needs or, are, you know, appropriate for a particular area, might have, you know, as we say, a different energy source. Someone might want to try putting, you know, some thermal electric thing or whatever, that at the moment to do that with mobile phone hardware, it's just uh, prohibitive in the complexity and the, you know, the resourcing and effort that it would require. So we, we need to find solutions around this. Um, and then, again, related to that, overall, we have this problem of scale dependency. And I think this is one of the, uh, the really key things. At the moment, to make a mobile phone, you need to have a big enough market and you need to have a big enough enterprise and enough capital and all of the rest of it to actually be able to go through the very expensive process of you know, designing the thing, getting injection molding tooling and all of that kind of thing uh, made. That, you know, to do that for a modern phone, it's, I suspect it's a few million euros uh, to do it uh, reasonably well. And if you did it on the cheap and skinny, it's probably still going to be something like a million euros uh, to achieve. So we have to somehow break this down uh, to make it feasible to do. And as I said earlier, simplicity is a key theme uh, to my mind. In fact, it's the only way I think that we can actually do it. So we've already talked about the challenges of just of building an Android ROM, let alone modifying it to do new things in any kind of sophisticated way. And even if you do, the hardware is actually too complicated and there's a whole pile of trust issues around the complicated hardware. If you can't understand something, by definition, it's a black box. And if it's a black box, by definition, you can't trust it because you don't know what's inside. So 
you know, we, ha we have this problem. Again, the digital winter, you don't want any black boxes, or if you do, you want them very carefully monitored and managed. Uh, and so the system has to be not simple enough to make once, it needs to be simple enough that we can actually remake it again and again and again uh, as we have need. It's a bit like the difference between a chainsaw and an axe, right? If you're going to be in a remote area and have to be self-sufficient, much better to depend on axe to chop your wood, because if you need to, you can make a new handle for your axe, and you know, with a bit more effort, you could do some very simple metallurgy and you know, uh, metal smelting with iron ore, if you happen to be lucky enough to have an area or copper or whatever. Um, it's going to be a much easier proposition than having to do that and then somehow make fine machine tooling and make new chain parts and motor parts and all of this kind of thing. So it has to be, if it's going to be resilient and survivable, it has to be simple enough that you actually can build it with relatively simple tools going forward. Electronics is always going to be a bit challenged in this area because you, know, you need to do PCB fabrication, you need to get components and things, but we have to try and reduce the barriers as much as we can so that at least, for example, component scavenging, for example, might be an option. Um, or devices that will be available because they're still needed by other industries that have more protection uh, as we head into a digital winter environment uh, that we can take and repurpose that kind of hardware. Um, and so then this kind of leads into uh, this tension then of saying, okay, if we make something which is simple enough, we know we as a community, we only have limited resources available to us to make this kind of resilient device. Do we make one or do we all kind of like run off and make different kind of things? Uh, and I think the, you know, the, this is a tension. I'm not going to claim that I know the absolute best setting for this. Um, I think we need to have, as I say, kind of multiple germ lines so that if one system gets chronic, you know, critically broken or proves to be ineffective and uh, that you know, there are others kind of in the wing that can kind of fill that uh, niche in the environment. But we don't want to have so many that we actually don't get anywhere. And so th this is a bit tricky. My gut feeling is you know, making a, an initial device that can kind of demonstrate some of these kind of positive properties and then so other people will look at it and go like, well, that's really great. That's got us forward. But you know, that was a really stupid design. I think this is a way better way to do it uh, in the way that we have that freedom in the open source community to do. Um, is probably uh, a pretty good way uh, to do things. And so I would say we're not yet at that end point of that proof of concept, but we're trying to, uh, to move things forward to that uh, and that point. So, come actually to the, uh, the megaphone that we're trying to create. And so, in terms of what we've actually set out to do for the, the goals and kind of the methodology, you know, we want something which is simple, secure, self-sufficient and survivable. Uh, a lot of the work that I do is, for example, with uh, you know, NGOs. So you know, We've worked with folks from Red Cross. We've worked with folks from the UN World Food uh, Program, who, pardon me, interestingly, are the distributors of communications in the UN cluster system for disasters, because they kind of like hand out blankets and they hand out rice and things. Someone basically said to them, well, you should also be handing out the communications. Uh, and so that's just kind of how it's fell. And so... You know, and it needs to be able to do smart, phony kind of things. Like, it would be great to have some navigation. It would be great to have, in a disaster context, the ability to fill in forms on the screen with a touch screen and uh, the rest of it, and have that uplink through. So, for example, if you think, you know, an Ebola outbreak uh, in Africa, for example, to be able to collect, you know, that case information to track down the, you know, the case zeros and all that kind of thing, you need uh, communications that can work. Often, these outbreaks happen in places where law and order and civil society is not really working, because if it was, then they wouldn't have had the outbreak there. It would have been managed more effectively. And so you need this kind of uh, you know, uh, dependable device that can work in independent of everything else that's going on. And that might have to do software updates, for example, over a really expensive narrowband satellite link that might be you know, tens of bytes per second or less. Um, so that was kind of some of the, uh, you know, uh, the motivation uh, around this to create it. And separately, he'd been working on the Mega 65 project uh, for a couple of years at that point. And it just kind of dawned on me that actually this kind of simple 8-bit architecture is powerful enough to actually be useful to do some things. And that's kind of, you know, well, why are you doing this, you know, the uh, fun proof of, uh, you know, uh, proof by example, really, of delivering the slides with this machine. Um, to show that you can do useful things if you write the code carefully, and carefully written code is more likely to be uh, verifiable and secure. Um, and it's probably, I don't think you can get any simpler than an 8-bit system and still be useful. 
Like, I don't think we want to be trying to use an Intel 4004 derived 4 bit CPU to do things. Um, by all means, if someone if can find a way to do something with a system that's that simple um, and they can still do everything we need and it makes it even easier to verify, fantastic. My gut feeling is it would actually be worse on every point because the amount of work that you would have to do to do each useful thing, you only end up with code which is actually larger in size. That I think my feeling is that the 8-bit architecture is about that sweet point. And so anyway, so as a result of the Mega 65 work, uh, it's based directly on that. So the, um, the phone um, actually is a Mega 65 in portable form, and we'll, uh, we'll show that uh, in a little bit. And yeah, and so we're getting towards that kind of proof of concept stage. So we had the first phone calls back in Linux Conf. So if you kind of dig back through, there's the, uh, the video of that talk where with a much earlier prototype, we actually had people calling the, uh, the machine, um, which is quite fun. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later as well about the, um, uh, some of the audio path kind of issues around that. So let's look at those six freedoms again now in what we're trying to do with the, uh, the megaphone. So energy independence. The first step is we've got a filthy great big battery. I hate it when phones go flat. And when you're in a disaster zone or these kind of vulnerable situations, you really don't want it going flat at the wrong time. Um, so we've put a 32 watt hour lithium iron phosphate battery that should have 2000 full charge cycles uh, in there. The device is about the size of a Nintendo Switch in terms of surface area. So putting high performance solar cells like you would put on a solar racing car or on your roof, uh, we can probably get about seven watts with that. Uh, and this, you do the kind of the math, that's you know, four or so hours of charge time but we know in reality that uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the solar environment will often be much worse than that. It might be only 10%. It might only be 1% of that if you're talking about uh, these kinds of latitudes under cloudy conditions. Uh, and so you really want to have the big battery and as big a solar panel as you can. And you want the power consumption to be as low as possible. So we've got uh, CPLDs, which are kind of like little teeny tiny FPGAs that are managing the whole power environment and wake up the main FPGA only when something important needs to happen. So we believe with 32 watt hours, we should be able to get about 1,000 hours standby uh, with a 4G off the shelf uh, cellular modem. And that's with a, you know, assuming that the solar panel was actually you know, like, you know, in a black box. Um, even the light here, if we had the, solar, the seven watt solar panel and had a sunny side up, um, we would be able to maintain charge indefinitely on the device because we only need to have about 8 milliwatts coming in. So we're talking about you know, <coughs> one one thousandth of the capacity of the solar panel. OK. So for communications, um, for independence, we really want as many possible ways to communicate as we can. And the naughty little things that we can't trust, in particular the cellular modem, we want to have as sandboxed and quarantined so that it can't spread its naughty plague of whatever vulnerabilities it has in there. Again, they're a black box. We can't trust them. They're too hard for us to implement. So this is kind of a decision that we've taken. We'd much rather have a fully open 4G modem. And if someone makes one, fantastic. We'll incorporate it straight in, right? Because the system is designed to be easy to change. But in the meantime, we have to kind of do with what there is. The great thing is that these M.2 uh, cellular modems are used in vending machines, in cars, in all sorts of things. So they're just they're common as, again, if you had to scavenge them in the future, this would be quite feasible. And it also means we can upgrade. So, and we have two of these slots, so we could actually have a dual 5G Commodore 64. Um, so that, you know, because who wants to have to lay, you know, wait extra time when you're downloading your games, right? And 40 kilobytes can take a long time to download if you've only got one 5G link, right? So we'll have two of them so we can do it in parallel. Because um, who wants to wait more than about, you know, four milliseconds to download uh, new software? Uh, and again, limited communications availability in these uh, kind of oppressive environments, this is actually key. You might only have short communications windows. So while it's a little bit tongue in cheek, it's not entirely. And of course, with the several mesh, we've been doing you know, uh, UHF packet radio. So we've put in tri-band LoRa uh, compatible radios in there, not LoRa WAN. We're doing it fully decentralized. We're just sending out radio packets and listening in with the modules. Um, we've also got ESP8266 Wi-Fi and some Bluetooth in there. So that's some other potential options. Acoustic networking. So we've got four microphones that are directly connected to our FPGA. So we can do crazy signal processing on that. And we've got a nice loud speaker that should work up into the ultrasonic range. So we could even have quite decent communications over you know, 10 or so meters in the acoustic band. Uh, and there's a, a crazy bunch, and I've forgotten the name of the research group, that do um, air gap jumping. Um, 
and they've done some quite crazy things with acoustics with, you know, if you leave your headphones plugged into your computer on your desk in a headphone jack, uh, you can software reconfigure that and make that so that it's a speaker and microphone. It's, anyone that's interested in that, holler me after and we can have a, uh, and I can try and find the, the links for you. We've also got infrared LED. And so the idea with all of these kind of con things and whatever else you can kind of do um, is that it should be really hard for an adversary to actually jam all of these things at the same time. You know, you might be able to do broadband RF jamming, but that's not going to stop the acoustics or the LED. And even if you can kind of make a lot of noise, it's going to be really hard to block, you know, the IR LED if people are kind of holding the devices near one another to do delay tolerant uh, transfer. And of course, any other crazy things that people come up with, again, a simple system design that you can extend it easily yourself. Okay. Um, security independence. So the operating system runs in our little 8-bit CPU, which is basically a slightly enhanced version of the Commodore 64 CPU. Um, it has an 8-bit hypervisor, which is 16 kilobytes in size, hardware limitation, um, because we don't want it getting bigger. If it gets 16K, then you have to throw some other things out and go, right, what does it actually really need to do so that you still have a system which is actually much more verifiable? Um, and this kind of small software, it should be quite possible on this machine to run a simple C compiler, for example, to be able to compile the software that is actually running the core operating system. So we can have that whole complete off-grid operation. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about, about having the untrustable components uh, fully sandboxed. Uh, so for example, the cellular modems only have a um, AT command serial interface to the rest of the system. And so this is going to make it much harder for an adversary to work out how with a fully compromised cellular modem you can compromise the rest of the system by giving presumably bogus responses to AT command requests. And because we know that's where the vulnerable point is, we can put a lot of effort in our software to really interrogate the command responses that are coming back and you know, look for any com AT command responses with you know, semicolon drop tables and all the rest of it in there. Uh, it should be pretty straightforward to pick up. Um, so we also have an integrated hardware and software ins uh, inspector so that you can real-time verify. So this is a little bit fun. Um, so I can hit mega tab, and so we call it matrix mode um, for a good reason. So the system is still running in the background, so the slides are still there, so I can go back to the previous uh, slide. Oh, I think it disables the joystick, actually, when I'm in there. Yeah, oh, there you go. I'll file a bug for that. Um, but we can, if I go back into it, um, we can look at all of memory in real time. So if you were truly paranoid and you're about to, for example, do some encrypted email on the, your you know, digitally sovereign device, you could actually go into this, stop the CPU, and then inspect every byte of memory and compare it to your physical printout of the you know, 30 or 40 kilobytes of your software and go, or well, you might, every time you might do you know, half a kilobyte or something, right? And verify it so that progressively over time, you've actually verified that the system is always byte identical at that point in time to what it should be doing. And again, the simplicity, we only have one program running at a time. Um, so you know, you know exactly what the system is doing. Uh, we can task switch. We've got a built-in freeze cartridge. If I press the, uh, the restore key, um, Anyone who's used a Commodore 64 and with an action replay will probably recognize the, uh, the inspired format. And so that's our program there running with hardware thumbnail generation. The colors are a bit wrong. We need to fix that. But you know, we've got other software uh, that we've had running on it. And so if we wanted to uh, you know, whoops, break up the presentation with a, a quick game of Gyrus, for example, um, we can do that. Oh, I need to switch the joystick port. I can do that in here as well. J. So, you know, if we wanted to, uh, we can do that. And then we can go back and, you know, pretend that we weren't doing anything naughty at all. Um, and, of course, I forgot to save what I was doing first, right? So I have to load the program again. So that's my bad. But that's right, because reboot time is about two seconds. Whoops. So the worst part now is that we actually we haven't got a command to jump to, through the slides, and so it actually takes a little bit of time to, uh, for it to render each slide as we go through. So that, that's my punishment for not uh, saving first. Uh, but actually, what we might do, we'll, um, we'll skip that for the moment, and because um, we're kind of at the right point anyway to, uh, to talk about it, 
which is the audio paths in a mobile phone. This is a really important area uh, to protect. So, so important that it's the only diagram that I've put in the entire presentation. Um, so at the top, we have a normal mobile phone. So basically, what we see is that the untrustable cellular modem is not merely untrustable. Um, it's like an evil squid that has tentacles that reach into every part of your mobile phone that you really don't want it getting into. So it has the direct connection to your microphone and speaker. The normal CPU in your mobile phone usually has to say, pretty please, oh, untrustable, completely untrustworthy cellular modem, may I please have something which you're going to tell me is the audio that's coming in through the microphone. Whether or not it's actually the audio or not, that's a whole separate thing. It might be doing all manner of crazy things first, because you can't tell, because there's a big fat black box in the way. Um, and then just to make sure that the, uh, you know, it can fully compromise what you're doing, often it's on the same memory bus. And so you, know, you might go, oh, I'm being all secret squirrel from the mo cellular modem and not asking it anything. And it's just quietly lifting the covers and looking at what you've got under there and going, oh, no, 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 that byte's wrong. You really want that value in that byte. Um, and likewise, the RAM and the storage. So you know, the cellular modem can totally compromise your bootloader and all of that kind of stuff along the way. Um, let's just say that that's not really a very um, survivable model or a very resilient model or a very secure model for a phone. So what we have instead is that we've basically put the, uh, the fully untrustable thing completely out in its own little tiny shed. We've got the tin can and string between us and it with a very controlled interface. And the microphone and speaker, thank you very much, are directly connected to our FPGA. So we can do encryption at the microphone and decryption at the speaker. Um, the storage is secure, so we could even have massive one-time pad. So we could actually do Sig Sally style, provably secure communications over distance if you can set up the key material beforehand for one-time pad. Um, so it's a radically different approach to what we see with uh, devices out there at the moment. So we'll just get the, uh, the last few slides up again. I never gone and Oops. So even simple software can have bugs. This is why we need many eyes. I think if I load this one first, yep, and now I can load the other one because it just hadn't loaded the uh, the fonts in. Yep, cool. That's coming. And you can even use the joystick to move around in the text if you want to. Um, OK, so if we think then about this whole, you know, like what are we actually trying to uh, you know, achieve around this, and what are some of the things that we need? So in the, in the, the Commodore-derived 8-bit platform, to us, has a whole pile of advantages as a basis for doing this. Now, we could have done it with a completely different platform, you know, like some, you know, we're thinking like Risk Five, for example, is a nice open platform. Could be an idea. Might actually be that the Risk Five CPU is actually still too complicated to actually verify and trust yourself. Is my kind of view. But I'm totally happy that other people might disagree with me. Again, multiple germlines, totally different ways of doing things. So that at least one of them keeps working at any point in time uh, would be really, really good. Um, and we can actually do kind of combination things as well. So one of the things that we're looking at is having, for example, a Raspberry Pi running the Pi port of Android that somebody else maintains. So I don't have to do it. And then having the 8-bit layer actually virtualizing all of the I.O. around that, including access to the SD card storage, including access to the screen. And this actually also makes it possible for us to, uh, to make custom mobile devices for people living with disability. And actually so that the Android, again, is easy to maintain because we don't even have to recompile it. We can just get the standard version and then make it think it's got a normal touch screen when in actual fact it might have some completely different input method going on. Um, so there's a bunch of advantages. And I've run out of the official time that I allotted, so I'll quickly go through, and then we'll go into uh, uh, to questions. So the, um, you know, the 64 platform is really well documented. So there's and there's a whole pile of tools and everything, programming languages. So this is pretty straightforward uh, to go through. We've already talked about capability maintenance. Again, so this is actually another key point. Making the hardware big actually is a massive advantage because then we can do normal PCP fabrication. We don't have to do any BGA. Um, part placement, which is a real pain to do in your home oven. It is possible, but you don't want to have to, uh, to learn how to do it in the digital winter. Um, and yet, it's actually this kind of similar size to existing kind of devices out there. Uh, so there's a bunch of advantages with that. Um, 
there's a whole pile of different things that we really would like some folks to help us with to try and get this finished and out there for people to try out uh, and to, you know, to be able to mature it and uh, make it work. So it doesn't matter whether you ever program an 8-bit computer or have ever done any FPGA work or PCB work or whatever. Um, you know, there's lots of space for people to, uh, to join in. Uh, what is quite, you know, we think it's actually both an important and actually a really fun and enjoyable uh, project to work on. Uh, and so, really, I just want to finish by actually saying that I think, it, you know, as I was thinking about this talk and preparing for it, I think actually it, it is a call to action. You know, the digital autumn has begun. Digital winter is on its way. We don't know when it's going to come, and it might come a lot quicker than we would really like it to come. Uh, you know, myself and the people who are already working on the project, we can't do everything alone. Um, we, we're doing what we can. We're going to try and organise another event uh, in early April up in Berlin. Um, but there's no need to wait for that to get involved. Uh, you know, we'll be around at the vintage computer area if anyone wants to um, uh, to come and have a look or you know or ask anything uh, about how you might get involved or just play around with the, the platform. It's quite fun to use. Um, whoops. And yeah, we'll leave it at, at that point. So any questions would be uh, really welcome. That's that was incredible. You have the best presenting setup that I've ever seen at the <laughs> Congress. Thank you. That joystick is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and the joystick is also open source hardware. I can give you the plans to make one of those yourself from, uh, from parts. It's a spare joystick parts for arcade games, basically. Yes, please. Yeah. OK, we're taking questions. Um, I remind you, we have six microphones in the audience. We also have the amazing Signal Angel that's going to relay questions from the internet. And we're going to take one right now. OK, so you already talked about uh, some events, but maybe can you a bit more elaborate on how you're planning to involve the community? OK, so how are we going to involve the community? Basically, any way the community would like to be involved, uh, at the moment, in terms of with the, uh, the phone, there's myself and kind of, so I work at a university, and we have kind of a couple of part-time students working on things. So the bus number is disturbingly near one at the moment. Um, so there's ample scope to help. We've got a, there are a few other people who are helping with the Mega 65 project itself, and so there is obviously this crossover in that. Um, but what would be really great would be to find, for example, a couple of people who are willing to work on software, primarily coding in C, so you don't even have to know any 6502 assembler to begin with. Um, to do things like you know, finishing off the dialer software and things that we demonstrated back in January and get it all working so we can actually walk around with a pair of large plastic bricks by our heads uh, talking on the phones that we've actually created. Uh, that would be a really great way to, uh, to get some initial uh, forward movement. And then things like case design, there's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, you know, we'd welcome uh, involvement on. Thank you. Do we have more from the Signal Angels? Yes, we do. So, okay, um, there's a question, when a prototype will be available? Okay, when a prototype will be available? I'm happy to give out uh, you know, uh, blank PCBs or post them to people, so I forgot to actually pack them with me. Uh, we've got like, you know, the next prototype is actually being built at the moment. Uh, so, you know, these can be built for about 400 euros at the moment. So, it's like only you can buy like five of these instead of an iPhone, right? So, it's already, it's, it's economically survivable as well in comparison. Um, it was actually it was one of the really quite funny things is we're kind of making this and going like, you know, a few person years of effort and we can already make a mobile phone. Okay, it's not as small and schmick, but it's got a joystick port, right? Does your iPhone have a joystick port? Um, so, you know, it's, it's amazing what we've actually been able to do quite quickly. So it's the kind of project where if we do have people kind of come in to help us, you know, I think like, you know, by next Congress, we ought to have people running around with uh, megaphones and being able to, you know, communicate in fun and uh, independent kind of ways. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, microphone one, please. Sure. Thanks for a cool talk. And I have another question because you want to reduce black boxes. Mm -hmm. But what's about encryption? Because it's really complex. And how do you plan to reduce this black box? Ah, okay, so an excellent question. Um, so the best encryption there is is actually the simplest. It's called one-time pad. 
So if you can actually meet with people, so again, if we're talking about focusing on supporting local communities with one another, if you get your megaphone and the other person's megaphone and you come in infrared range, for example, and then you shake them like martinis to generate some random data, and you do that until you've decided you've got enough one-time pad, and that one-time pad is secure enough in your device, then actually, like, XOR is pretty easy to debug, right? Thank you. Microphone number three. So you um, talked about the form factor right now being mm -hmm. a Nintendo Switch. Yep. Uh, do you have plans on going smaller than that, more we like a classic mobile phone? Yeah, I think it's actually quite possible. So, the, so this is, if you like, the, the first version is this one. So you can see it's about five centimeters thick. Um, the second one, we think we can get down to about four centimeters thick, but it's otherwise the same size as PCB. We've got a student at the moment who's going to try and work on making one that's about the size of only the screen, still probably about four centimeters thick. Um, and we think that that's going to be quite... It's a, the PCB layout has basically been cursing me for the last three months uh, to try and get all the tracks routing without it needing to be a 15-layer, uh, you know, sponge-taut uh, kind of PCB. But that should be quite possible to do. And again, that's the kind of thing, once we've got a working prototype, then some people go like, okay, we're going to be on the miniaturization team to, you know, pardon me, try and make something which is even smaller. Um, but you know, there's, there's always trade-offs in these things. Again, the smaller you make it, the less solar panel you can have on the back. So there's kind of these things. But certainly trying to make it as thin as we can, I think, makes a whole pile of sense. Honestly, you can make it smaller, but I don't think you should because when the zombie apocalypse happens, it's a communication tool and, and, and the and weapon. Yeah, and, and exactly, that's right. It's kind of, you know... It's, Exactly. Or you can use a full-size one as well, right? It's kind of got you know, quite a nice uh, solid metal keyboard in there as well. A question from the internet, please. Sure. Um, so, what do you think about the Open Moco phone? The Open Moco phone? So I'm trying to remember the details of, about those. I mean, the whole... It, again, everything that's being done on all of these fronts to make fully open devices with as few black boxes as possible is fantastic. So as I say, if OpenMoco can make an M.2 form factor cellular modem that we can put in the megaphone, I would be so, so happy. But we can do a whole pile of stuff while we're waiting for that to happen. Thank you. We actually had a talk yesterday about from one of the people behind the OpenMoco. So you can watch the recording if you want. Next question, microphone one. Sure. Hey, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I was interested in the Mega 65 itself. Is that, mm -hmm. a, is that available? Can, 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 is it, is yes, it sold? It, <laughs> okay, so the two most common questions we have about the Mega 65 is, can I buy one now and how much does it cost? Um, unfortunately, uh, the answer to both of those is, we don't yet know exactly. It'll be a three-digit number in euros for the price. This is pretty certain. Um, but at the moment, our big challenge is we... So this one is it's a prototype made with vacuum form moulding. So each case costs upwards of 500 euros for the case. This is not really sustainable. So we know we need to make injection moulding tooling for that. And so um, the guys from the German part of the Mega65 team um, are running a fundraiser. I just have to be a little bit careful with that. As Australian law for fundraising is a bit weird. So I'm not doing any fundraising. Some people here in Germany are doing some fundraising to try and raise the, uh, the money for the mould. So if you look at mega65.org, you can find out what they're doing in that space uh, and, you know, and have a look at that. Thank you. Do we have more internet questions? Yep. Nope. Cool. Cool. I think that's it. So yep. thank you again for the wonderful talk. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.